So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview. Looks like I got here just in time for the 8 o'clock show. Okay. See if you want, get him back. If you're second time, shoot him in the ball. So the last thing we need in our house is another serial TV commitment. But then someone turned me on to, late, I know, Lifetime's Army Wives. I am so screwed. If you're already a fan of the first-year drama, you already know it's sort of like Desperate Housewives set on an Army base. It's also the most successful series in the Lifetime Cable Channel's history. If you're not familiar with the show, check it out. We'll wait. No, just kidding. The series is based on Under the Sabres, the unwritten code of Army Wives, a book by Tanya Blank. It's full of sex, lies, booze, and bitches. And I mean that in a purely professional sense. Hell, it's even got a wife who isn't a wife at all, but a dude married to a woman who's a lieutenant colonel. All of which is a brief introduction to my guest, Catherine Fugate, the creator of Army Wives, which launches its second season on Lifetime on June 8th. Catherine is also the niece of TV legend Barbara Eden, star of I Dream of Jeannie, and a few million grown-up men's fantasies. Catherine, welcome to Mr. Media. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. What a great introduction. My pleasure. Which, which part are you laughing about, the, uh, the men's fantasies? Well, it's the bar the... reading, if I had a nickel. You know, it's the old, if I had a nickel. I don't know how many <laughs> men I've dated were trying to get to her, so <laughs> it makes me laugh. Oh, oh that's, no, no, is that it, true? <laughs> <laughs> she, she she made an impact, didn't she? <laughs> uh, yes, she did. She did. Um, you know, I, I, I'm actually going to ask you about her later. <laughs> I'm glad okay. that, that I'm glad to know that that's an okay topic. Um, I, what what I was really concerned about was not mentioning Barbara so much as I, I'm 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 hoping that you're not offended that I refer to some of your characters as uh, <clears throat> bitches. <laughs> Well, I think some of them refer to each other that way, so I suppose that's yeah. fair. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? I, you know, I, it's interesting. I, I and I, met, I refer to my daughter periodically uh, when I do interviews, and, and this this is no exception. Uh, she's eleven. She's at that point where she's learning that that word gets tossed around for a lot of purposes. Uh, is it? Is it? Uh, is it at all challenging or difficult as a professional woman to use that? Uh, in in you know in in a program like this and and do you have any you know does it make you squirm at all to hear you know people on your own show referred to each other that way? No, I suppose it depends on the context. Like anything, sometimes people are worthy of that word. <laughs> Other times, <laughs> it, so. <laughs> I hear you. I hear. You. Well, what what is the uh, what is the hardest part of portraying um, army wives on your show? The hardest part. Um, I think for me it's to get the authenticity, the balance of they are they are heroes as much as the soldiers. I mean they have an incredible uh, what's the word I'm trying to look for an incredible amount of pressure and responsibility put on them, equal to perhaps the soldier themselves. You know they're often raising an entire family for 18 months by themselves. They're worried every day did their husband die or not. So you want to keep that integrity intact, what they go through, versus creating good melodrama, you know, that makes the series work. So you never forget you're portraying real lives, real people, so you have a higher sense, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, you want it to be good and entertaining and honest and show all sides of any sort of enclosed enclave like a like Port Marshall is. So you do have your bitches, <laughs> and then you have your <laughs> heroes, and your honorable moral centers like Claudia and Joy Holden in our show. Well, one of the things one of the things I've noticed in watching um, you know TV over the years, which of course at 47 I've watched a good share of TV, um, is that uh, sometimes these shows will start uh, with the perception of the characters as something, and then the longer the show is on, uh, there are, there are dramatic changes made to the character. And sometimes I wonder if it's true to the character, or if it's just a matter of the writers reach a point where they got to do something different with a character. You know, someone gets tired of playing the bitch or, or the goody two-shoes. And 
um, you know, you're you're into your second season. I, I know. Um, is that a, is that a challenge at all? Well, I think it, it, that's a challenge for any writer with any longevity of a show. It, people mm. are all things all the time. Not even the villain is 100 percent evil. I mean, we have so much nuance and the three dimensions of any character. So even the hero has to have flaws, and the villain has to have his weaknesses, and we have to understand how he got there. So to do it well, you do want to constantly turn people, look at them from another point of view. I mean, ultimately, the hero is the one that fails, makes a mistake, but gets up, and then the villain takes that. You know, it's where they, where you go with the same mistake, the same flaw, is what determines, mm. I think, a hero and a villain. So you want to continually show the flaws of all the people. I think when you get, you get back in a corner when you want to make people only one thing. Mm-hmm. So that's a, sort of an answer, but <laughs> the idea is, <laughs> is always to keep them growing and changing. That feels organic. And I think for the audience, they can feel when it's being pushed because you've run out of ideas versus when mm-hmm. it's honest and that people are, a sh- you know, we're a mess of all sorts of things. Hmm. Um, you know what? I want to pause for just... <laughs> we're a very no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, that was a, it was a good answer. It's a good answer. I want to give out our uh, phone number because I see well, there's a there's a live web chat that accompanies the live interview, and I see that it's getting a little busy in there. So I want to give out our phone number and let people know that they can call in and ask you a question if they like. Um, the number to call if you're listening to us live on May 8th is 646-595-3135. That's 3135. It is probably a toll call. So wherever you are, unless you're using Skype or some other secret uh, government uh, telephone <laughs> service. Um, so, um, how did you uh, how did you discover, or, or how did how did uh, uh, Under the Sabers, uh, the book by uh, Tanya Blanc, uh, how did that land in your in your lap, so to speak? Well, uh, actually, it came to me in the form of galleys, so it wasn't even published yet, hmm. and oh. it came it came with a book a buck slip. Just the name Deborah Spera, who is the president of production at Mark Gordon Company, and it had no other mm. explanation. It came from my agents to my house, and I thought wow. it was a film because I've basically been a film writer. Mm-hmm. So I read it thinking I was writing a movie, and came in to meet her, pitched it as a movie, only to have her stop me and say, "This is a this is a TV show." <laughs> I go, "What?" Because <laughs> I hadn't created a TV show before. I don't think I would have been the first person to go to. There's a lot of people who have that under their belt. But right. She had read several scripts of mine and felt that I, they were all women, female-driven, and she felt that that was a better match. So this kind of came really out of left field for me. Hmm. Well, now let's let's not discount some of your TV experience. I mean, you did work on a, a pretty tough uh, a tough old broad named Zena, as I recall. Yeah, I did. I did. But that was the only thing. The only thing I had done was Zena, and I'm very proud of that show. Actually, that yeah. was really. It's been a very memorable experience working on it. So I definitely do female empowerment, try to look at the women's point of view, get their voice right. Like I said, get the dimensions of, you know, women are complex creatures, aren't they? <laughs> so you want to um, always what, be on, what, on, you know, honor that complexity, and that's not always easy. So. Women are complex creatures. Wait a minute, I'm trying to, I'm trying to absorb that. Women yes, are they complex are. creatures. I will admit that freely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, men are much gonna... simpler. My dad said, "Sex, sports, and food, and we're done." You guys, <laughs> you've got a whole thing going on there. <laughs> Sounds like a smart man, your dad. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yes, it came to yeah. me as a thinking was a film, and then I said, "Well, I'd love to do a TV series. Let's give it a go." And we are, we, we were blessed every step of the way. It's such an uphill battle. You know, you go in there with 150 people and they'll, you know, projects, maybe they pick, what, 25. Then they pick 10 of those to shoot. Then they pick three of those to actually air. So your odds are basically 150 to, you know, maybe you're the three for that particular network that they're going to actually put on. So we never really thought we would get this far. It's such a hurdle each time. <laughs> and right. it's been such a blessing. And the, then you've got to worry about will the audience actually turn on the channel and watch you. Such as yourself, mm. will they be interested? Will they care? Will they watch the next week? You know, it's such a it's a never ending challenge. <laughs> well, it was certainly a breakout year for um, uh, cable series. Uh, your show, uh, Mad Men, uh, Breaking Bad. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of something else. Um, well, I watch the closers, my, the closer myself. I watch that. Oh. I watch Damages. I watch Saving Grace. So I really was a big fan of cable. And I had used to watch Six Feet Under, and I watched In Treatment, 
I kind of do cling to that. I think you have a better opportunity to get some nuance and some surprises. More it, there's, def- there's definitely uh, that middle ground that seems that a lot of producers seem to be taking advantage of between what the networks do and then what like uh, HBO and now Showtime uh, is doing. That uh, it doesn't have you don't have to have uh, a series of four letter words or uh, not that I'm against that. Lord knows I'm not against four letter <laughs> words, but but um, uh, there is that middle ground, and, and uh, you know people like yourself seem to be finding it and really mining it for uh, for quality material. Well, it's there's so many there's a gradation within cable. Like HBO and Showtime can get away with all the four letter words they want. We can't use one four letter word, <laughs> so we can't. Well, I guess we can use damn and hell. That's just, we can't use shit. Am I allowed to say that? We can't use the, yes. the S and the F yes. word. We can't use those four letter words. Yes. So. So. Where you could on HBO and Showtime, but we do have more opportunity, I think, on cable to be a little more of a niche show than you would mm. on mainstream television. You better appeal to well, a much broader base. And Catherine, just for the record, uh, you can use uh, you can tell us all of the words that you can't use I can. on the show right here, <laughs> right, right here on Mr. Media. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, Mr. Media, I'm allowed. To, well, here on standards and practices, I'll get an email saying, uh-uh, <laughs> <laughs> can't say that word. Page 25, <laughs> delete that word. <laughs> now, do you uh, do you bring any personal experiences with uh, military life to the show? Well, uh, yes and no. I didn't grow up in a military home, which I think a lot of people expected, which made it a little more exciting for me in that when I read about it, I was so overwhelmed and taken back and, and really moved. I actually cried at one point in a couple of interviews about what the women and families give up and the sacrifices they make. I was really touched by it. At the same time, mm-hmm. my uncle did serve in Vietnam, and since I didn't grow up in the, that particular household, but I would hear all the stories at Christmas and holidays and hear how he did everything. And so I had a little bit, a little bit of, a little bit of touch of it, but not entirely my own. So the per- mm-hmm. I think for me, it's a perfect balance. I'm not jaded. I'm still open and excited, and really, every story means a lot to me. And you know, I'm very touched and thrilled to be a part of it. So mm-hmm. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I like exactly so where I am. I have just enough experience to remember my uncle when I was eight teaching me how to use chopsticks, saying this is what I learned in Vietnam, and putting him in my hand, and he was in his ACUs. And that, I have that memory so ingrained, and that's uh-huh. a nice memory to have. But I didn't grow up on a, a base or a post where I hear it's much harder, you know, the life is much harder for a lot of people. Hmm. My My experience with it is all fairly peripheral uh, girl I dated in, in college went off and joined the army and uh, so I, I had a little touch of that when I showed up on base uh, uh, unexpectedly and got a <laughs> I got a good taste of uh, here's a good here's a good one I I left a bit my uh, my old car uh, needed some oil and I put it in and apparently uh, and then I left and I'm taking off from the base this is in the Carolinas somewhere and I'm coming back and I realized that there's some maniac tailing me <laughs> and has been for miles, and I pull over, and he pull, he gets out of the car, and there's like five people in the car. I hadn't thought about this in years. And uh, he gets over, and he comes up to my car, and I'm not getting out of the car. Uh, and he <laughs> says, uh, were you just on such and such a base? I said, uh, yes. He said, what? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> He's in uniform. And I'm like, y- yes, sir. He said, did you just change your oil? I said, y- yes, sir. He said, <laughs> Well, you left the can of oil and the and the the funnel next to your car. You need to go back to the base and clean that up. I oh said, my goodness! That was, I said that was about thirty minutes and thirty miles ago. He says, "I don't care. I'm going to follow you back there." So oh I'm looking back goodness. in the car, and I see his wife and kids, and they're just like looking anywhere but at him. And I thought, <laughs> "Wow." But unfortunately, I didn't follow that relationship into the military. Although I did wind up marrying a. Uh, uh, a 30-year colonel's daughter, but uh, he was he was out of the military by then. Wow. Although we did have to call him Colonel for the rest of his mm-hmm. life. Now that I think about it. Uh, <laughs> I was um, did a, briefly did a movie on the NFL, and everybody's coach, even when they're no longer the coach, they're still called coach. Oh, absolutely. Hey, I I coach uh, middle school uh, girls sports, and one of my favorite things about that is that uh, over the years, the kids, even though they're years out of out of your uh, your range. They still they see you on the street in the store, and they still call you coach. So I can appreciate that to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great. Um, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about um, each of your main characters, if you don't mind. 
Okay. Um, and maybe you can tell us uh, a little bit about um, where they've been and, and kind of where they're going. Um, why don't we start with uh, Pamela Moran? Okay. Uh, Pamela Moran. Well, when we met her, she was a sergeant's wife, and then her husband Chase was inducted into uh, Delta Force, which is actually a special op. And so that put her in a whole new world that's sort of separate from the officer's wife. She's still an enlisted wife, but she's also so separated from them now, so she's going to go through what does that mean. And she got her radio show, so that gives her some life, and she's become sort of the messenger to the post, giving people inspiration. So she's got a great voice for it, actually. That's what that's when you start writing for your actor. Her voice, Pamela yeah. Moran, played by Bridget Moran, and her voice is so, it's so radio ready <laughs> that we went, <laughs> you should be on the radio and suddenly that's a light bulb goes over everyone's head she should be on the radio and the next day you're building a radio station on a set and then suddenly you're on a radio show so that's kind wow, of wow is that right yeah she's uh there is a couple of army wives who have their own radio show and that inspired us and i know that she's investigated them and listened to their shows to get it right and uh, the great thing about all the actors is they care so much about portraying their characters well and they've all met sort of their doppelganger in real life spend time with them to make sure it's authentic. But So that's Pamela. Still has her two kids. Her husband, she has to deal well, with a husband who can't call her and has to disappear from time to time because of his job. He has no contact. Right. He being gone. He can leave, and you don't know if he's coming back in a week or two years, and he'll never be able to tell you either. So she certainly has the you know, most enigmatic lifestyle of them all. At least the other ones will get a letter. They'll get an email. They'll be able to find out. They'll know when they're going to return she has, you know, she really has to live under that shadowy life. Hmm. I like I liked the moment with her where <laughs> she gives birth to those kids that she's uh-huh. carrying as a surrogate. And and they turn out to be African American. It was just like, right. what? I'm sorry, did I just see that? <laughs> <laughs> that was, so. they were actually, I believe it was Newsweek, but a magazine just did a whole story on all the military wives becoming surrogates because it's a way to make money. Yeah. You're looking for jobs at home because you're raising your kids at home, and uh, or you have to get childcare, and I think that's a, a new way they found. But right out of ripped out of the headlines, as they say. That was yeah. That was quite, that was quite a twist. And what about uh, Denise Sherwood, who was played, uh, of course, by Catherine Bell? Um, oh gosh, now who who is more beautiful? We can talk about that, but they're at the Barbara Eden conversation. It's Catherine Bell. So, uh, <laughs> she, uh, I was I was yeah. Go ahead. You were going to reveal something tasty, and you took it back. <laughs> well, it, Catherine Bell's character certainly has a huge arc in that we started her a submissive, sort of traditional military wife, much of the throwback, and we've been watching her change and grow and come into her own. So her story is much like Kate Chopin's Awakening. She's becoming a, becoming her own person, stepping into her own light, realizing who she is. And she's not a wife, not a mother. I think it's a it's a, a lovely arc for a lot of women that age, in mid thirties, suddenly stepping down and going, hmm, you know, her son's gone, husband's gone a lot. Like, what's she going to do with her life now? So it's actually one of my favorites because it, it, every episode has momentum to see more and more growth, more and more awareness, more you know, blossoming. Like that again? I'm gonna deck you. I don't know why I ever agree to this. Because you know deep down that you need to kick some ass. So, come on, let's see what you got. Okay. Come on. Oh, oh! You almost hit me. If I wanted to hit you, I would have hit you. Keep your hands up. Now that I got your attention, let's see what you got. Come on, give it to me. No, I need a snap. You got a snap. Now come on, give it to me. Let's go. Come on. So, uh, better, yes. How come you're so good at this? Because when my first husband hit me, it broke my heart. And I swore I'd never let anyone hurt me like that again. That's why I started to box. I know what it feels like to lose a part of yourself when someone hits you. Okay, so that was that was uh, Roxy uh, teaching uh, Catherine Bell's character uh, Denise how to box. And I, I think uh, before we uh, were so rudely technically in- interrupted, there was uh, some comment about uh, the beautiful uh, co-stars. And I was going to say, before we started talking today, I was tr- trying to decide if I was going to say anything about uh, Catherine Bell and uh, Kim Delaney in particular, who appealed to me, I guess, because of my generation. But uh, I think if I was 
you know, 10 or 15 years younger, it would probably be uh, uh, Sally Pressman, I'm guessing. <laughs> they, they all have their appeal, let's put it that way. <laughs> that's, that's a good ensemble. <laughs> Absolutely. So they definitely... Let's, I was going to say, let's t- tell, tell us about uh, Kim Delaney's character, uh, Claudia. Uh, Kim plays the now Brigadier General's wife. So what she's experiencing, she's basically the moral center for the show. She, everyone comes to her for advice, for counsel. She's certainly the, she's an educated woman from Harvard, and she's trying to run, you know, be the, be the um, inspiration for the post, how people should live, how they should treat each other. And she definitely steps outside of what's expected for her rank or her position based on her husband's rank. But what she's going to come to learn as a Brigadier General's wife is that this set of friends she has, they're very, it's very atypical for all these men in Roland as a man, all these women and this man, to spend time together. They're all different ranks. Some are enlisted wives, some are officers' wives. But because of our pilot and the setup that brought them all together as a team or a tribe, as we call them, they've become their unlikely group of friends. But the higher up you go, the harder it is to keep maintaining that unless you want to make changes, unless you want to become progressive and make statements. Mm. So I think she's going to learn, uh, you know, how, what it means to be the head of the, you know, the, to be the queen on the post. Before it was Lenore last year, and now suddenly she has mm-hmm. to take that position, and Lenore actually gave her a bit of advice. You know, when you get up here, you'll find what it's really like. You know, you wow. Yeah, and, it's, and she's, she is a very strong character, at least at this point. Now, there's some... Some suggestion I've read that uh, maybe she's uh, holding something back or hiding something. Is that? Yeah, that's what we always. There's always. That's what I said about heroes. She's certainly a hero, heroic woman, a hero figure. But everybody has flaws, and it's how they pick themselves up is how they learn to be a hero. It's the lessons mm-hmm. that you learned, I think, and what you do with them. So it makes you heroic because we're all ordinary people, and that is what she has. So we're always going to learn more and more about her past, what she's overcome, where she took these lessons. Yeah, she's she's, in, she's very deep, that character, as well as Kim Delaney herself. So she's the perfect person to play that role. Well, Kim is very centered, very spiritually centered, very deep, well-read woman, you know, looks looks for challenges in her life and overcomes a lot of obstacles. So I think they, they're a perfect match, actually. Hmm. And what about um, Sally Pressman as uh, Roxy LeBlanc? I mean, uh, it seems like... Um, she, you know, among younger viewers, that she could really be quite a breakout character, just because obviously she's a beautiful woman, but but also right, just right. the attitude and and all that. Well, that, that's exactly true. She she is the breakout star on the show, and I think that's because there's so much light and life in her. And again, like she's the perfect person for Roxy. Everybody is cast well cast for who they're playing. It's amazing. We're very lucky that way. And Sally came right out of Yale Drama School, so really had no experience. And she's pretty untapped. And those resources, when you get that untapped, untapped gold like that, it's, it's it's really lovely. And she just stepped right into the character, threw herself in it, and she's become that character. And she's hmm. she's so authentic and so honest with who she is as a person, as well as the character plays that way. Like Roxy just tells it like it is. She is who she is, but she's also stepped into this world that's full of tradition and expectations on who she should be, and that mm-hmm. whoever she should be affects her own husband and his career. So she's got a real fine balance there. You know, how much can I give up of who I am versus to match and, you know, to fit into this world? And certainly she's also the eyes of the military world for all of us civilians who don't know. When we see everything through her, everyone else has been there. They're used to the acronyms. They're used to the structure, the discipline, and the rank of the Army, but she's not used to any of it. You know, she's not going to R in Alabama. You know, so she, the last thing she cares about is almost your story is, oh, you mean I can't leave my bike on the lawn? You know, I can't leave right. my oil can by my car? She's that person, so the whole thing is mind-boggling to her, and that's what we need that eyes into the world for the viewer who isn't in the military. And mm-hmm. anyone who is, I think they can look back on that fondly and go, oh, I remember when I did that. You know, I saluted indoors, I called someone by the wrong name, things like that. There's a, there's a great moment uh, where she, uh, very early on, I guess this is in the pilot, she uh, She's at a, a, a dinner. She's at a table with her her new husband, and a commanding officer, I guess, comes over, and uh, the husband immediately stands up and jumps to attention. She does the same thing, and she salutes, and he gives her this funny look, and she says, uh, I guess I'm not supposed to do that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's sort of her role for us, is to, to, to constantly remind you how mannered and 
uh, specific the military is. I mean, most of us will drive right by those posts of any army post or a military base and think, oh, I wonder what goes on there. Well, she, that's, you know, that, this, she's our eyes into that world. What goes on behind those gates is, is Roxy or Sally will show you that far more than everybody else. So, hmm. She's a great character. You're right. Everyone truly, truly admires, you know, what she does and what she brings to the show. So we're lucky to have her, I think. Now, what about the character who's a wife but not a wife? Kind of the, uh, the Bill Clinton, if Hillary Clinton was elected character. Um, <laughs> that would be, uh, right? I mean, uh, Roland, Roland Burton, right? He's, uh, first of all, Sterling and uh, Wendy, who play Roland and Joan, are such a beautiful couple together. If you mm-hmm. if you ever see them, it's almost like watching a theater play when they act. They're such great actors. And both of them are very atypical in that, you're right, you have a military wife who happens to be a man. That's certainly representative of the progressive army where we are now. That's new. And then you have an African-American woman who's risen to lieutenant colonel against all the odds, and she's commanding basically mostly men and in, in insisting that she has their respect because of what she does and how she shows up for her job. So both of them are pretty atypical for the show. And mm-hmm. uh, they're being African-American on top of that, they both come up to me and said it's such a great opportunity to play a well-mannered, educated person. And I didn't even have that perspective until they said it to me because they said basically I go on auditions and I'm a gangster. <laughs> I'm in prison. <laughs> So, and that was a new perspective, too. I mean, that's the beauty of the show is everyone's offering a new perspective based on the character they play, the person they are. Like Terry Serpico plays Frank, is a military son. His father is, was yeah. in the military. So, oddly, his father was named Frank, so he feels very <laughs> specific. So he brings a lot. This is what it was like growing up. This is what I dealt with. So we're really lucky with the whole cast, but specifically the character of Roland What's interesting for him is he is kind of caught in two worlds himself. He's not a woman, so there's only a certain amount of things he can do with the wives, certain conversations he can engage in, because then he will become very male. But he's also not a soldier. So when all the men are running around and and they have you know such a male life on there, if it's, if they're doing their PT, if they're having their conversations, he doesn't quite fit in with them either because he's not a soldier. He's not in the military. He doesn't have that language down. He's a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And in this sense, he what, the biggest challenge for him is where does he fit in? You know, where does he belong? Hmm. It's, it's a, hard if you really think about it. No, it's a it's a very well drawn character, and, and I like that that uh, you know he is involved in the women. I, I imagine there'll be uh, 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 the storylines about uh, you know times at which he does not fit in, yeah, and does not have a place have with them. You have to draw the line, too. Yeah, when you suddenly become a woman and a man versus when you're an army wife and a soldier. I mean, wh- when is that? It's well, one of the... Asia. When is she a yeah, woman? No. Now that she's pregnant at the end of the season, now she's, for the first time, her body is truly female. Otherwise, she's mm. been in ACU, she's been in Class A, she's been commanding, she's been in charge, and now suddenly she's very much a woman. So where does she mm. fit in? Well... Let me ask you this. In, in terms of, uh, you know, a, a great way, of course, if, if you're a producer or a network to get uh, people to watch is, you know, sex, uh, sexy <laughs> bodies, exposed bodies, all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, uh, there, was that, there was that moment where Wendy got up on the, on the bar and, and uh, you know, was getting all hot and bothered. We, we were introduced, almost, almost introduced to Roxy when she wears her... Uh, her, her thong in the uh, ladies' room. Uh, there's been other. There's been you know plenty of uh, uh, sexual situations. Uh, you know, again, as a woman producer of a woman's show, where do you where do you kind of draw the line in, in terms of what you know what's appropriate to the situation and what's going to you know lure people to watch the show who might not not otherwise see it. See, I was worried there for a minute. You were filing a complaint. But basically, I I think, oddly, like when Joan's character is based on somebody, a woman who came back with PTSD, and uh, apparently a lot of women are, and I think there was a statistic recently that 50% of the soldiers coming back from Iraq are, are suffering some form of PTSD, and it's always, it's either sexualized, it's anger, it's, it's, not speaking, completely withdrawn, shut down. If they, they deal with substance abuse, trying to numb the memories of whatever created the PTSD over there. 
So we took this one character based on truth, and this is what one woman's story was. Wendy investigated and interviewed a lot of people, a lot of women coming back to experience PTSD. So it was in line with a symptom of PTSD. So we've tried to make sure everything is, A, like you said, sexy and fun, visually interesting, but also still grounded in some truth. Same thing with Roxy. This is a woman who spilled wine on her dress, would think nothing of walking out and use the air dryer to clean her skirt. Now, I did that personally when I was a waitress. <laughs> so really? I know exactly that. You take your shirt off, your underarms are sweaty because you've been working all day, you're cleaning the shirt, putting it back on. It's something a lot of young people do, and it isn't that. If it's been done before in my world or someone I know's world or we've spoken to someone who did it themselves, then you know sometimes it's okay. If that's the truth, it's okay. That's how I draw mm. the line and what's gratuitous versus what's honest. Seems fair. And no, I'm not filing a complaint against any <laughs> exposed female flesh. You're not going to get me filing a complaint <laughs> on that page. Well, we try so. to get Roland and uh, chase his shirt off as much as we can. They're all We have very good-looking men on our show, too, so we're trying to you know, quid pro quo for the ladies. I'll take your word for that. I wasn't really paying much attention to them. <laughs> Listen, you've got, you've got uh, Kim Delaney and Catherine Bell on the same show. I mean, you know, what, what more does a, uh, an American male need to see? Uh, you know, you could just watch, you could watch that show with the sound turned off and be just as affected. I, um, <laughs> and I, have to, I, I guess I have to ask you, uh, not that this is uh, page six or anything, but uh, how's Kim Delaney doing? I mean, uh, you know, we're all aware of her... Uh, uh, trials and tribulations over the years, and she, you know, has struggled in and out of a couple of TV shows. Uh, how is she doing? Well, she's here, as to say, she's a model citizen and a, and um, the friendliest, kindest person on the set. She's pretty much Claudia Joy. She's the hostess, knows everyone's names, knows their birthdays, cares about. She's extremely warm and kind. So mm -hmm. we are, you know, we're, we're the benefit of whatever work she's done spiritually to get mm -hmm. herself here. You know, we benefit from that because she's doing fantastic and she's a real leader on the set. All, you know, real professional, I have to say. Always knows her lines. Never raises a fuss about anything. And very professional. Well, Takes the younger actors under the wing. He's the first one to come it, out, like when Barbara was here or anyone. The first one to come here and shake a hand and welcome them. She's a real ambassador. Well, it's good to see her doing well, and, and she certainly looks great. And uh, I hope, mm -hmm. you know, I hope that'll uh, be sustained over time. That would be... Uh, that would be well, great. It'd be a Mr. great media one to your shirt off in some scene. If there's any way you can. <laughs> 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 hey, let's be clear. I never said that. No, of course and, not. And, no. And, and, and <laughs> I, I, for those of you who are who are looking at the, the the chat room and can see the video of me, I'm <laughs> holding my hands to my head because I I want you to get out of my head. Damn it. Um, <laughs> uh, Catherine, we've actually got a caller, so let me let's go to the caller okay, and see what the what this brings. Um, hi, do you have a question for Catherine Fugate? Uh, yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sure. we can hear you. Uh, yeah, um, are you related to Barbara Eden? Yes, she's my aunt. Um, does he have a MySpace? Because I found a MySpace with a picture on it. Do you know? Well, she doesn't. Because she Barbara doesn't? She doesn't even do email. Okay, well, I look... A, a frightening thing to her. <laughs> I would be pretty certain that she doesn't have a MySpace page. Okay. Well, anyways, I just looked you up on Wikipedia, and it said you're descended from Benjamin Franklin. That's pretty neat. Yeah, Barbara is, too. It's that same side of the family. My mother's middle name is Franklin, and uh, Franklin goes all the way up, middle names, last names. Wow. What relation? Is it a direct relation? Yeah. Straight down, I guess. The Fra Franklin name is all the way down. <laughs> uh, wow. All right. Well, uh, thanks for calling. I've, I've got another thanks question or two calling. for, for uh, uh, Catherine uh, before we get done about uh, Barbara Eden. But I want to I want to come back to uh, Army Wives because I know we've uh, I don't want to run out of time here and, and get to talk to you about the uh, the upcoming second season. Um, uh -huh. uh, first of all, are there any are there any major cast changes, either additions or subtractions? And well, see, and, that's what uh, we can't discuss. We left you in a beautiful cliffhanger, so oh. we have no but, idea who comes oh. back, who doesn't come back, and after June eighth, we'll know. What's <laughs> this? The, what, what's this? We shit. 
You know exactly what's going on. <laughs> no, we, I, I, I'm just mysteriously in an office space. I have no power or control over anything. <laughs> it's like I point to other people. What? Especially when people come on the street and yell at me. I have, uh-huh. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we left in a huge cliffhanger. So obviously, there's not much to, to tip yet. But um, it's emotional you, you, and it's good. You can't have, tell us have, anything. Come on, who's I can't, listening? Because it's just, we, even it's just the two of us here. To, there's no teasing of a cliffhanger like this. Unfortunately, you have uh, everybody there. Pamela Moran lives. How's that? Because she's not in that. <laughs> she's not that far. So you, those, the fans of Pamela Moran should be feeling pretty good. All right. Well, that's the fans we got of Joan Burton. It's the Pamela and Joan show, <laughs> season two. <laughs> those two are pretty safe <laughs> because uh, you have you have Trevor, you have Chase, and Frank are deployed. You know, really, you have Michael Holden, Pamela Moran, and Joan. So it's Pamela and Joan and their friend Mike, season two. Oh boy! <laughs> well, can you? Now I'm sure you know the answer to this. How many? How far into uh, the new season are you? Well, we're sh- we're at shooting episode four right now. So we're okay. because of the writer strike. You know, everyone's in a in a big big push to get done, and we start our first episode June eighth, and we're going all the way um, up to I think the end of November. And uh, wow. we have 19 episodes this year rather than 13, so we'll have more time to really, you know, get into some meat of the stories rather than rushing them. The good and the bad oh, okay. table when you have 13 episodes is you hurry because you only have right. 13. You have to start something and conclude it pretty quickly. When you have mm-hmm. 19, you get a little breathing room, so that'll be fun. 19 episodes, 15 to go. That sounds like plenty of time to get Kim Delaney out of her. Oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> um, now, do you uh, do you follow any of the um, any of the blogs that are devoted to Army Wives? I I uh, I saw one uh, called Standing By. It's written by uh, a woman named Jan Westner, who I guess her husband is in the military, and I, I see that she blogs live about every episode. And I guess apparently blogs live about the repeats as well. Hmm. I haven't seen people blogging about the show per se. I've seen mm-hmm. uh, military websites written by Army wives discussing, mm. you know, what their experiences are like. Like Tanya Bianca wrote the book, has one, things like that, things she sent me. Um, but I, I, I actually sometimes I'm afraid to say, to read what people <laughs> say about the show. <laughs> I like to stay a bit in my protected cocoon. You know, I, I write what feels honest. I make sure it's vetted through Tanya. We have, milit- we have the DOD this year and military advisors. And then I try to write from my heart and, and, do my very best to serve the stories, but sometimes when you read things, it's just not, you know, it takes a strong, strong disposition. <laughs> uh, I saw, I think, I think in TV Guide there was something this past week, uh, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't think of what show they're referring to, but they were saying that uh, maybe, maybe, and maybe it's lost, um, but they were talking about that there's a danger these days because the internet, the internet is so interactive that for mm-hmm. creators of some shows that are so uh, that really involve their their viewers so much that if they start reading the comments and thinking about it, it it has the potential to affect the direction that the show might have otherwise gone. Well, it does. I think I, I know a lot of creators and a lot of uh, people say this. Say just what you say. They can be overly affected, under affected. I think there's a fine line. We definitely get reports back from the studio saying these characters. These storylines did better. These characters did better or worse, and we we'll, we get, do get a general sense. But I think when you read them yourself, it there, there's so much that goes into making a television show. And I think sometimes um, the the purer you can stay when you're sitting down in front of your computer, you're probably mm-hmm. better off. Otherwise, you can if you start second guessing yourself. I think that for a writer's strictly from a writer's perspective, if you second guess yourself, you, you're in trouble. You sit down. Mm. You will, well, I, you will veer off where you should go. You will veer. You will veer. It's like when people try to write for the market. They try to write what they think will sell. You know, they forget that what you what works is when it's honest, emotional, and real and from your heart. So that worries me <laughs> to read too much. I um, what's the, what's the stupidest uh, network note that you've gotten uh, on this show? And then what's the smartest? On this show. Oh my goodness! I, I don't know if I should touch that with the fifty. <laughs> I know I should go in the other room. I, I, I can't even think, honestly, not even try to evade. You get so many notes from so many 
places. Uh, you know, some of them are production oriented. You get them from actors, you get them from the studio, the network, directors, cost reasons. You know, you lose something because you can't. You know, it's far more expensive than you thought. So it's hard to right. think of a a stupid note. I tend to look at all the notes as coming from a a good place. Everyone has the same goal of making this good. They're all coming with the best intentions. Sometimes it can affect a character negatively or you know, something we projected further in episodes down the line and we have to remind people that it's a series, you know, not a one off mm-hmm. movie per se where it could happen here but it has to have longevity, you know, some choices you make. But I don't think notes notes are stupid. Some of them they because they come from where you know, like I said, they come from the heart and the best place, sometimes the note itself isn't the right solution. But mm-hmm. they're telling you something's not right here. I didn't feel what I should have felt. I wasn't angry enough, wasn't emotional enough, wasn't moved enough. And that's really the note, not necessarily the solution. Mm. So you haven't, I mean, you haven't gotten any notes. I, I, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but you, you, you haven't gotten notes that said, you know, we'd like to see from some man at Lifetime who says, you know, we'd really like to see some of the some of the ladies out of their clothes a little more often. That that would really that would really help rating. <laughs> we really don't get that. You know, I, I, I we we have a lot of women at Lifetime. Maybe that's why. But uh, we the note their notes are very smart. Actually, they're very character driven. That's where they come from, because this mm. is a character driven show. It, it and it's about the personal relationships and the women's growth and and the relationships with their husband and the life they've all chosen to serve the country. It, mm-hmm. Because it's so character-oriented, that's where the notes come from. If it was an action film, maybe, or a murder or procedural where don't like that gun, don't like this, you know, murder has to be fresher, you know, we just don't get those kind of notes, I think. They're mm. more trying to understand the psychology of why someone would do something. Okay. Well, you know, I, I mentioned this uh, this one blog, and it just because I, I know we're going to have a lot of people who are fans of the show listening, I want to give out the give out the URL for this uh, if anyone wants to check it out. This is uh, uh, Jan Wessner. It's W E S N E R, and the blog is at blogs plural b l o g s dot tampa bay dot com backslash standing by backslash standing by is one word. So there you go, Jan. Hopefully uh, you will get some traffic from that. Um, did, when you were uh, uh, casting the show, uh, mm-hmm. were there other people that you originally had in mind for some of these roles? Uh, and uh, I know you won't tell me who, if that's the case, but I'm just wondering if these were, you know. <laughs> the, the, this is an honest answer in that no. Catherine Bell mm-hmm. and Kim Delaney were pretty much settled on by everybody uniformly. And then Sally and Bridget were auditions. So mm-hmm. was Sterling and Wendy. Everybody else auditioned for the show. And once they yeah. came in, everyone pretty much said it's that one, it's that one. It was a great scenario where everyone was on the same page. Everyone understood what the character was and understood that that actor fit that character. So we really didn't have those issues like you do in a lot of shows. I have had those on other ones, so I know exactly what you mean. This one was pretty uh, pr- pretty easily cast, I'd say. Like Sally came in and it was a slam dunk. She was just so mm. perfect, so sassy, so alive, and like I said, right out of Yale and completely... Sometimes that's the best way because they don't know yet. You know, they have they're still so, you know, life like and excited about being there. They haven't gone to fifty auditions where they're oh, here's another one I'm not gonna get. You know, she just came mm. in all bubbly in personality and it was like there there you go, that's exactly who Roxy is. She was walking into a new world in some ways. The film business. This was Roxy was walking into a new world in the military. So the exact yeah. energy you needed. Well, um I wanna play uh uh, and hopefully I won't lose you this time, but I want to play one, one last uh, brief clip from the show just to give people a, a little taste of it, and uh, then we're going to come back and talk about uh, Aunt, Aunt Jeannie. I mean Aunt Barbara. No, I'm just kidding. All right, <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, everybody take a listen to this clip from uh, Army Wives. It's Mrs. Baker, isn't it? Oh, Lenore, please. Lenore, I realize we don't know each other very well, but uh, you spread a rumor that my husband, Michael Holton, is racist. My husband lost his promotion to yours because of it. Sweetheart, you've made a mistake. Please think of something you can do to make it better. Claudia and Joy, what would you just say to the Brigadier General's wife? You would never stand for someone spreading a lie to get a promotion, Michael James, and neither will I. 
know there'll be consequences, don't you? I can handle Lenore Baker. We'll get some pie. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I, I, I love that. That was great. Um, so, <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this. And if I've missed this, I apologize because I have not oh. seen every episode yet. But uh, is there any chance that your aunt Barbara will make an appearance on the show if she hasn't already? She has. Oh, uh, you picked See the that? right clip because Lenore Baker, who's played by Rhoda Griffiths, is a fantastic woman, fantastic lady. She. Uh, Barbara is, uh, see, Lenore is over Claudia Joy in Ray. So Barbara right. comes in with Robert Forster playing her husband and oh. puts Lenore out of commission so that Claudia Joy ascends the throne. So she ends up being, uh, it's a very cat and mouse sort of intrigue episode where Barbara sets a trap, catches Lenore, exposes her, and she's off the base. So she did. Wow. She shot a gun, played opposite <laughs> him a lot, befriended her. She did a great, great job. And hoping to bring her back. She had so much fun, and everyone had fun seeing her. So, well, I, I, you know, I, like I said, I haven't seen every episode yet, but I've seen, one, I've seen several. And, and, Eleven, I think, episode one, 11, very toward the end of the season. So you'd have okay. To, well, it just seemed, I, it, it just seemed like knowing the relationship you have there, she seemed like such a natural um, for that show. So, so it's good, and maybe she'll be back. That would be great. And actually, uh, I have to say, with the web chat that goes alongside the. Uh, the uh, Mr. Media interview, um, one of our listeners has sent me a note saying, Mr. Media, you have to rub the genie lamp for Barbara to come on your show. So, <laughs> so, well, she uh, I, to do interviews, so I'm sure that's possible. Well, if you'd like to pass on the invitation, we'd love to have her. I have a feeling there'd be more than a few people who'd like to talk to her. <laughs> and actually, you know what? I had, um, oh, my God, I'm going to embarrass myself because I can't think of the poor guy's name right now. Uh, he played the uh, the soup Nazi on Seinfeld, Larry. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. gosh, Larry. I, he's I'm a friend of hers. He did the Odd Couple right. with Barbara. They toured. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, he uh, he was telling me all these wonderful stories about how great she was to work with and and how they had such a good time. So, mm-hmm. you know, sure, go ahead. Yeah, pass that on. We'd love to have her on. We can we can I make will, those. I will. Um, well, and I, along that line, I wanted to ask you. I mean. I don't know how old you are, Catherine, but I wondered if if you were old enough to have uh, experienced her at her you know greatest point of fame and. and uh... Well, it, I I was born when the show, the first year of the show when it get aired. Oh. So I did. I was. It was only ret- retroactively, like it was on mm-hmm. and off when I was very young. So I didn't have the height of the show when it aired, but I certainly. Was became quickly aware of the longevity of that show and how much it moved people and meant to them and it was such a positive show and it gave people such a break in life is what I keep hearing. When we go somewhere, even to this day, she walks in and you see, like you said, grown men. They suddenly just become very young. In their face, they're so happy. <laughs> Played a character that brought people a sense of happiness and light to their lives, and right. they really love her. And that that's a, she knows she's so grateful and she knows what she's done. She knows she's done a good thing. She loves that she was a part of it. And you do, you watch people's face transform when they see her because it throws them back to their childhood and happy times. And so I'm certainly aware of you know, how much Jeannie has meant to people, but the actual time when it was airing, I was too young. Hmm. Well, I, I was... A uh... house full of Jeannie memorabilia. You could... <laughs> <laughs> There's the bottle, the dress, some props, things like that. So. Oh, how, how cool. How cool. Yeah, I, I, I sometimes wonder if... If my uh, affection for uh, the American Space Program is because I can remember, <laughs> if, if, yeah, because I can remember when we landed on the moon, and I guess I was nine, or if it was all those episodes of uh, I Dream of Jeannie leading up to then, because I am old Who enough knows? to have watched no, it, was, you know, in prime time. It was a great, great show. I mean, I have them all. My daughter, I have a one and a half year old daughter, and I have them for her on DVD, and so I can introduce her to them. And we did. What was funny is we did. Um, we went to. It's like Nickelodeon, no, TV Land, TV Land had an event where they had Barbara sort of in a Jeopardy setup with two fans, and then the host was asking questions about the show, and Barbara couldn't answer one of them, and the fans could answer everything, because she said it's like when you're doing a show here, you're doing three and four episodes at once, and you're constantly, you're looping, you're doing a table read, you're acting in this one, you're getting costumes for that one you're then you come in after post for that and it's hard to keep them all track and remember everything because everything's so out of sequence 
even the episode mm. you're shooting is out of sequence. So you, right. you, you, it's hard to keep it all straight. And she was every time couldn't hit the buzzer, and the people outplayed her. I think she had zero, and it was a very funny moment for her. And she looked at me like, "Hey, where's some help here? Give me some answers." <laughs> <laughs> so, it was she, a funny day for us. She didn't pull a William Shatner and tell them all to get a life and leave her alone. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but she was. It was so she. The thing that Barbara is, she's an extremely gracious woman, extremely articulate. Again, very well read. She reads books, goes through books like crazy. She half the time we shop, it's to get books, and she'll buy huge piles. And she loves biographies, you know, history, anything. She just really voracious appetite for knowledge and extremely polite, extremely polite and gracious and kind. So if someone mm. were to walk up to her. She's always grateful that, that she did something for their life. She did, never has that, hmm, you know, I'm over it. She never will be. And that's what makes her, in a sense, very heroic. Is she's happy for what she contributed to the world and grateful. Yeah, that's great. That's really great. Um, I'll, tell I wanted to add- I'll tell you one story that, yeah, about Barbara. Oh, please. That cracked me up. It just happened not too long ago. We were at Costco. So first of all, you have to picture us at Costco. It's a very yeah, exciting crying. trip for her. She loves Costco. And we're pushing our cart, and we're hurrying because she always has a list, and she has a, almost like a map of the Costco itself. Everything's in order. She knows exactly where she's going, which aisle. <laughs> she's a careful shopper. will go down every aisle like I do. It's, she, you know, she's focused. It's like plan, execute, go. And we get in, <laughs> we shop. And we came around a corner, and she ran her cart into Samuel L. Jackson, the actor. And both of them looked at each other and had this same look on their face, like, oh, my God. He goes, it's Barbara Eden. She goes, it's Sam Jackson. I mean, they were extremely <laughs> excited. They'd never met before. And the, the, the level of, oh, you know, I'm such a huge fan. They were talking on top of each other. And I'll never forget thinking, that, isn't that lovely? Right there, you know, two very talented oh people extremely well thought of and here they are very excited to see each other so oh my god and did did anyone get a picture of that that would have been great no but it was such an odd thing in costco if you can just keep it in the whole thing it was very <laughs> i just stood back wishing i had a camera saying that was such a nice moment oh that is that is a that is a great moment yeah that, that's very <laughs> nice of you to share that with us too i appreciate that um so uh, as we wind down um you uh, you know, when we started talking, you mentioned that it was kind of odd for this uh, show to come to you, the idea of the show, because you had done most of your work in film. Um, mm-hmm. Is the show pretty much occupying all of your time now, or are you still oh, you yeah. still have some film stuff? Or no, I don't even think I have sleep time. It it is <laughs> it's a nonstop sprint. There's no wow. there's no lull. It's seven days a week, and then again, I have a child and. It's, you know, my whole life is the show and my child. <laughs> the show and my child. I can't even, like, watch shows I love. I, I don't remember the last time I read a newspaper. It, pretty much wow. you start and you're on full throttle until you're done. So it, it truly is everything. But it's exciting. It, it's exciting because you know you're telling the stories of real people in real life and a, there's a real war going on. And if you can shine a light on them and let people know, ultimately, mm-hmm. you know, just show them the sacrifice that the people are making for us. You know, for our freedoms and for our country, then you feel like you're doing a really, feel like I'm doing something great and something powerful for them. So, so mm-hmm. it's worth it. Wow. Well, um, Catherine, we're going to run out of time, so I just, I really want to thank you for coming on. It was a, it was a wonderful hour, and uh, please okay. do uh, can I pass tell you on the invitation. Last, can I, may of I say course. One last thing? I want to yeah. pronounce my name properly for the, all of America. Thank you. <laughs> there's, you know, how there's Brett Favre. Which is spelled Favory, which I love. Yeah. It's Favre. Well, he's from Louisiana, the quarterback, and, and my family roots, I'm French on my father's side, and we're from Louisiana, and the the, spell, the pronunciation is CJ, even though it oh. never get that from the spelling. But I'm gonna, I've decided I'm going to make it my mission, like Brett Favre did, to get the Louisiana pronunciation of Cajun names out there. <laughs> so, Catherine Fugé. There you go. That's my Catherine last. Catherine Fugé. Yeah. It's, it's, you never right. guess it would you. It's actually no, I, our family tree. It's F U G E T on my dad's side. And oh my goodness! Well, fifty-three that they changed the spelling but kept his pronunciation. I'm going to suggest that your publicist in the future put your the, the correct uh, pr- a pronouncer after your name when he sends out the when he sends out the <laughs> material. <laughs> and I'll talk to him about that myself. Okay, but, uh, Mr. Media but, is it Media? Me, media? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like. Uh, 
Dr. Spichemin on 30 Rock. <laughs> well, I went out with Kim Delaney, who I would think would be pretty simple, and, and it was Miss Delaney. And I went, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> well, uh, Catherine Fugey, thank you so yep. much for being thank on the you. show. It was, a, it was a great hour, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the start time. of season two. Well, thank you. Well, thank Thanks you. so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. So you can find a DVD. Oops. <laughs> you can find a DVD of the first season of Army Wives, which is available for sale on the Mr. Media site or Amazon.com. Uh, you can also download individual episodes of the show from iTunes. Now, for dozens more celebrity or media newsmaker interviews, surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my previous conversations with Billy Bob Thornton, Cheryl Hines, Milo Ventimiglia, David Fury, Anna Gunn, uh, Bill Prady, Stephen Pastis, and many others. You can also read full transcriptions there. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media or making uh, Mr. Media one of your favorites, whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, Blueberry, Zencast, or iTunes. And folks, especially if you can see me waving to you, thanks so much for listening today. I really appreciate your time and look forward to talking to you again. Bye, everybody. <laughs>